أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قد أفلح المؤمنون الذين هم في صلاتهم خاشعون والذين هم عن اللغو معرضون والذين هم للزكاة فاعلون والذين هم لفروجهم حافظون إلا على أزواجهم أو ما ملكت أيمانهم فإنهم غير ملومين فمن ابتغى وراء ذلك فأولئك هم العادون والذين هم لأماناتهم وعهدهم راعون والذين هم على صلواتهم يحافظون أولئك هم الوارثون الذين يرثون الفردوس هم فيها خالدون الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا إلى يوم الدين أما بعد With the tawfiq of Allah we have reached Juz number 18, part number 18, which incorporates all of Surah al muminun And thereafter, it has the entire Surah Al-Nur, and then it has the beginning of Surah Al-Furqan. So that's just over two surahs will be covered today, inshallah, in the discussion of part 18 of the Quran, Qad Aflah al muminun Qad Aflah al muminun is what the surah is ref- is what the chapter is referred to or what the part is referred to and that's because the first surah in there is surah al-mu'minun itself the chapter of the believers now the believers are discussed throughout the quran you know many many surahs are discussing belief and believers so why is this chapter called surah al-mu'minun and probably the biggest reason is that it starts off with qad aflah al-mu'minun Aflaha, I explained some time before the word falah, aflaha, falah is the ultimate success beyond which there can be no success. Any success of the world that anybody enjoys, there's generally going to be a climax after that and then you have to give another, you have to then achieve another success to get the same kind of enjoyment. The enjoyment that you get from one kind of success, you then have to basically find something else to win. You find something because everything gets stale, everything gets, becomes history. Whereas the ultimate success here is after which there'll be no failure, no downgrading, no, no, uh, no anticlimax, and so on and so forth. So that is the true success of the hereafter, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, pr- uh, has promised to the believers. That's why he says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ mu'minun. The believers are truly successful. الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ now these are the descriptions that are provided of these believers who are good enough for success, who are going to get this success. So that's why I believe that this surah is called uh, Surah Al-Mu'minun. And now look at the word in Qad Aflah Al-Mu'minun. I want you to keep that in mind. And then when we get to the end of the surah, I'll tell you to check how the surah ends and see if you can find some kind of connection between the two, inshallah. So, this is Surah Al-Mu'minun, which is a Makki Surah. Uh, we've had a few Madani Surahs, but this is a Makki Surah. And it has 118 verses and six sections you can split it up into at least. And again, it discusses the usul of the deen, which means the fundamentals of our faith. And it starts off with nine verses, right? Nine, ten, eleven actually. Nine verses of the description of the believers. Right? It's about a description and then the 10 and 11th verse, that's about what they're going to get. And so, أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْوَارِثُونَ Those will be the true inheritors. الَّذِينَ يَرِثُونَ الْفِرْدَوْسِ Because they're going to be inheriting the firdaus, the Jannatul firdaus. Subhanallah, هُمْ فِيهَا خَالِدُونَ In which will they will abide forever. And may Allah make us of these. We clearly will have some shortcomings uh, in some of these aspects. We ask Allah to... Uh, to, to improve those things for us. So it's the verses which I read at the beginning. 
I'm just going to mention the seven characteristics that are due from believers. So the first one is الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ They are in a state of reverent fear while they pray. So their prayer is not just ritual. Their prayer is not just an outer form, but they actually contain the reverent fear in their hearts when they pray, when they stand, Allahu Akbar. If you want to really understand that, we look at the prayer of the Sahaba. If you look at books as Hayatul Sahaba, etc., you will see that description in there. Um, of course, mu'minun, that's the first one, they are believers, and that means the true believers in the proper sense of the term, with no show, ostentation, complete sincerity. And then number two would be they are khushu. They have khushu is reverent fear. One is when you fear someone, you run away from them. You don't want to be with them. You want to be as far away from them. You want to avoid them. That's the normal khawf that you have generally from others. But with Allah, the fear needs to be that you want to actually get closer to him because you know that the sanctuary is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this khushu is a very interesting uh, submissive reverent type of fear for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Allahu mu'ridun so they do not get involved in redundancies in futility in waste of time in distractions like that they focus they're very focused individuals they don't waste their time then you have they they fulfill their zakat properly and then the next one in verse 5 is that they protect they are protective over their chastity they're pre protective over their private parts and everything related to that so they are chaste and modest individuals of course except where it's allowed and encouraged which is with the wives or that which their right hand pr pr uh, possesses and in that they're not going to be considered blameworthy and anybody who uh, Allah just uh, talks about this in a bit more detail because this is where a lot of people make mistakes in the in the immorality aspect or the morality aspect anybody who chooses beyond that who seeks beyond that beyond what's halal then those people will be going beyond the line and transgressors and then the next characteristic is those people who, are, who fulfill their covenants who are good in their promises if we are making false promises to people even in just to, uh, just to not make people feel bad that you constantly say to people, okay, I'll do this for you, I'll do it, don't worry, I'll be there, whatever, and you don't, you don't even have an intention to. You're just saying that you think it's a good thing to do that because you don't want to make people feel bad, you don't want to be upfront, you don't want to seem like you're letting people down, you will eventually let them down like that. So a person should be very careful about fulfilling promises, they should not make uh, false promises. And of course, trustworthiness, honesty, all of that is included in there. And then finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that those people who are very regular, very particular, very mindful about their prayers, which means in every sense of it. So they pray them on time, they pray them properly, they fulfill the adab of the prayer, and they have everything that's included in that. So can you believe that the first point and the last point, they're both about salat. الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ They're reverently fearful uh, in their prayer, and then they're also regular in their prayer. They're mindful of their prayer. That's why, you know, when people talk about Salat, Salat all the time, it's not just a rhetorical discussion. It's a very important discussion. That's why in the description of the believer, Salat is mentioned twice. Right? So, أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْوَارِثُونَ These are the people who are going to be the inheritors. Now, after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the next uh, several verses then, it's about the embryonic stages and how the human being is formed. So that is all discussed. I'm not going to go into detail about that because we did that the other time about the piece of uh, the, the fluid moving into uh, uh, um, a, a, starting from a drop of semen to uh, f fluid uh, that moves on to uh, blood uh, that moves on to congealed, uh, sorry, uh, that moves into a piece of flesh and so on and so forth. All of that is... Uh, discussed here. Now remember the thing about this that's very unique is that today all of this stuff you can observe You go to the National Natural History Museum in London You can actually see them, they've made the models and you can actually see this online If you actually sign up for certain 
uh, pregnancy websites, they actually send you how your baby is supposed to look at, you know, in any given week, and so on and so forth. Now, all of this stuff is kind of known. We have the ultrasound scans. We can actually see this. But remember, this was done over 1,400 years ago when the Prophet ﷺ is saying this loud and clear through the Quran, through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's word, that this is how it happens. And none of this, uh, you know, none of this has been disproved. I mean, this is the reality. Right? It's not something that can even be disproved in the future because it's a reality. I mean, you know, we've had post-mortems and all of these things. So remember, that's a very unique feature of this idea that this is a miracle of the Quran that Allah is mentioning this. Right? After that, there's several, uh, there's several things that are mentioned. There's a lot of uh, cosmic evidences that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to deal with now. Right? Talking about major... Uh, realities and phenomenon that you see, uh, phenomena that you see outside. So, for example, Allah is going to discuss the seven heavens and all the amazing creations within the seven heavens and the and the earth. Then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uh, He speaks about uh, like we know exactly how much water to send, right? Rain and how this is quite a beautiful section that talks about. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala causes various different orchards and, and fruits to go, grow from there and so on from which you, you eat. It's just reminding people that this is all done by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then moving on to verse 22, uh, 21, 22, that's discussing the animals, the meat that you consume, the animals that you, uh, you ride upon and all the other benefits that are, that are from there. So, then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after that starts the story of Nuh alayhi salam. So, these are always the different arguments that Allah provides from, uh, from the realities outside to prophets and, and so on and so forth. So now, the stories of the prophet begins, and thus the first story you have is about Nuh alayhi salam. And again, there's just an anecdote. There's just a small section of his interaction and his discourse with his people. And eventually the discussion, this is the other discussion in the Quran, which uh, we've read one of them. Uh, this is the second discussion about him uh, building the ark and what to do in there and so on. And uh, this one is a bit more, it's brief. It's, it's not as detailed as the other one. But again, it's said in slightly different wordings and there's slightly different details in there. Then... There are the stories of uh, anecdotes from a number of prophets. So you have Hud alayhi salam then, then Salih alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, Harun alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, his story is mentioned there. And that goes from verse 33 to about 50. And you can read that. But what's interesting is that at the end of all of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the prophets, Ya ayyuhar rusulu, kulu min... Oh messengers, eat of the pure things and do the good deeds, righteous deeds. Allah knows what you do. And then, from verse 52 onwards, those two, three verses, your ummah is all one ummah. Meaning, the core message of all the prophets of monotheism relates, it's all the same. They're all sisters in, they're all brothers in faith. All the prophets are brothers in faith. And the ummah is all one in terms of the one essential belief. They may differ in terms of the small uh, details, but in terms of the belief, the core beliefs, all of that is the same. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said the problem is that there's all these people who then separated. Even after each of the prophets, there are people who basically disunited. Right, some went on one extreme, some went on the extreme, uh, on another extreme of the shortcoming. Some people went on exaggeration, and there were very few people left in between. You could say, and kullu hizbim bima ladayhim farihun. Every group of these are just satisfied with what they have. They're not willing to even listen to the other. They're not willing to, to seek out. This is one of the major, you can say, one of the core reasons for disunity among people, is that they. Th this is one of the fallacies. They just think they're not willing to. Uh, even consider the other person's argument. That's why he says that whenever you want to argue with somebody and debate with somebody, the, one of the etiquettes of doing so is that if he has a position, don't attack his position, but go and ask him first, why do you have this position? What are the underlying evidences uh, that make you have this position? When he's told you that, then you can attack them if it's worth attacking. 
because a, p a position is a position. You see, you should really be attacking the basis of it. So now you can debate with them on the basis of it. What that also does is that it gives them some amount of, you know, they may be able to actually convince you. If you because initially you might think, why are they holding that view? When they don't, you know, you don't know what the evidence is. So when they mention the evidence, if you still consider that you've got better evidence or that understanding of theirs is wrong, then basically you can respond to that. That also shows them the res that you're respecting their opinion. They're actually asking about why. You're not just going in and just blaze, uh, guns blazing and attacking somebody like that. And a lot of the time that has a more greater effectiveness in convincing somebody otherwise. When you actually talk with them on the basis of things as opposed to just their, no, your opinion is wrong without even hearing what they have to say about it. But anyway, we're not doing a discussion of the Munadhara Rashidiyah here. So we will move on. Then... So th this is one of the biggest challenges that we're facing today. فَتَقَطَّعُوا أَمْرَهُمْ بَيْنَهُمْ زُبُرًا right? So uh, may, may we be able to reconcile a lot of our differences just by, la just by that. Thereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kind of describes implicitly in the rest of the verses, um, you know, quite a few of the verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is then describing how people should approach just generally, what are the characteristics of somebody who is looking for the truth? And that is, they're fearful. In the ladino min khashiyati rabbihim mushfiqun, right? They're fearful of their lords. Uh, they're fearful of their lords' punishment. Another one is that they have they have faith in all the signs of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and they try to do their deeds in without uh, showing off. They've got a very sincere reason for doing what they do. And number number three, if you look until verse 61, you'll see that they have uh, the sifat of ihsan in the, sen in the sense that they like to do things well. And they like to rush towards ulaika yusari'una fil khayrat wa hum laha sabiqoon. They always want to do good deeds. When you have that sincerity of wanting to do good deeds, a lot more will come out of your life and you can, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inshallah, with sincerity, inshallah, the truth will open up as well. Of course, then there's a discussion of those who don't, and thus they're condemned. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seizes them. That's the whole discussion if they're going to be obstinate and so on and so forth. Now, Allah is turning his attention back to the people of Makkah directly, saying that, uh, uh, talking about the Quran and their arguments and disputation about the Quran. So, from verse 66, you see. قَدْ كَانَتْ آيَةِ تُتْلَى عَلَيْكُمْ فَكُنْتُمْ عَلَىٰ أَعْقَابِكُمْ تَنْكِسُونَ مُسْتَكْبِرِينَ بِهِ سَامِرًا تَهْجُرُونَ أَفَلَمْ, يدد... أفلم يَدَّبَّرُوا الْقُرْآنَ Have they even pondered the Qur'an? Shouldn't they think and reflect over what the Qur'an it says? They'll find, mashallah, that there's a lot of good things in there. أَمْ جَاءَهُمْ مَا لَمْ يَأْتِ آبَاءَهُمْ الْأَوَّلِينَ didn't they, didn't they know their prophet that he was a truthful, trustworthy individual from before? Am bihi jinna? Do they say that he's he's insane, that he's got insanity on him? Bal jaahum bil haq. Allah came to them with the uh, the, the Prophet ﷺ came to him with them with the truth. But the main reason now is provided in verse 70. Wa aktharuhum lil haqi karihun. They they just don't dislike the truth. That's the problem. When you dislike the truth because you think you're going to have to give up something, you're going to have to give up your life, you're going to have to give up your luxuries, your indulgences, that is one of the biggest debilitating hindrances and factors to a person following the truth. That's why sincerity and honesty is just going to get us somewhere. Anyway, then there's lots of arguments about that which I am not going to uh, carry, uh, go into, but if you, if you look at that until about 71, that's the case. Thereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, this discussion, now the next discussion from وَهُوَ الَّذِي أَنْشَأَ لَكُمُ السَّمْعَ وَالْأَبْصَارَ وَالْأَفِدَةِ From verse 78 and onwards until the end. It's about depiction of the various different aspects of the Day of Judgment, of the approach to that. And uh, a bit of advices are given there, like in verse 96, there's a advice given in there that make sure that when you do respond to somebody, you do it well, and so on and so forth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, in all of these verses you'll see, you'll see him discussing the people of uh, remember there's this, this dual discussion of shaqawat and sa'adat 
Shaqawat is wretchedness, misfortune in the hereafter, and Sa'adat is the ultimate falah and success. That's a very good discussion there that you'll see. They used to basically, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let's just look at a few of these verses. حتى إذا جاء if you look at verse 99 حتى إذا جاء أحده الموت قال رب ارجعون when death will come to them say let us go back uh, our Lord لعلي أعمل صالحا فيما تركت maybe now I can do some good deeds كلا never right this is just a word they're saying right um, فإذا نفخ في السور and then when the trumpet the horn is blown فلا أنساب بينهم يوم إذن ولا يتسألون they'll have no relationships in between everybody's going to be an individual then and then Allah talks about the one whose weight is heavy whose books of deeds are heavy and all of that and then Allah says ألم تكن آياتي تطلع عليكم weren't my verses read out to you right but no um, you used to deny them and and so on and then they will actually confess Allahu Akbar now what's very interesting is these verses Look at verse 112. Allah will then ask them in the hereafter. Tell me now. That life that you have done and now you're facing the consequences of, how many days did you remain in the world? They said that, oh, it was only like a day or part of a day. Because now when they actually see the hereafter, the infinity of the hereafter dawn upon them and they realize it, the past life, this life becomes nothing, it becomes short. Because in comparison, even though it's 60, 70, 100 years in this world, it is nothing in comparison to what they see now and it dawns upon them about the infinite life. So they said, oh, that was just a day or a part of a day or something. So that's why Allah will say, that's trying to remind, remind people that, look, this is that temporary life. And then Allah says, أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ عَبَثًا وَأَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْنَا لَا تُرْجَعُونَ did you think that we created you for no purpose, redundantly, futili with futility, and that you're never going to come back to us, that you're never gonna, not going to return to us? Then Allah says in this Jalal way, فَتَعَالَ اللَّهُ الْمَلِكُ الْحَقِّ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُ رَبُّ الْعَرْشِ الْكَرِيمِ وَمَنْ يَدْعُوا مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرَ لَا بُرْهَانَ لَهُ بِهِ So فَتَعَالَ اللَّهُ الْمَلِكُ الْحَقِّ Transcendent and high is Allah. The sovereign of truth. There is no God except He, Lord of the noble throne. And then Allah says, وَقُلْ رَبِّ اغْفِرْ وَارْحَمْ وَأَنْتَ خَيْرُ الرَّاحِمِينَ This is a dua that's been taught to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Say the dua, O oh my Lord, forgive and have mercy, for you are the most merciful of the merciful ones. That's a dua that we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except from us as well. Now, a few other things. Ibn Kathir uh, relates that one day the Prophet ﷺ gave a khutbah in front of the Sahaba. And uh, what he mentioned in that khutbah is that he said that when the people of paradise uh, will enter paradise and the people of hell will enter hellfire, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask them this. So it's relating to this verse that how long did you stay in the world? He'll ask both the people of paradise and the people of hellfire. So, O oh people of Jannah, how many years did you remain in the world? And they will say the same thing, a day or part of day, because it just seems like that. The whole concept of day, in terms of the rising of the sun and the setting of the sun, will all be gone. It's just going to be now in terms of the whole vast expanse of infinity is going to be now the issue. So, that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, MashaAllah, what he won't say MashaAllah, but he'll say, in, this, in that time that you said you got, just that one day, you did very well. You did a good business. Your tijara was good. And that's why, by that, you've been able to buy and purchase paradise. You've earned paradise forever and ever. Just for that one day's of work, or that part of a day's work. Allahu Akbar, make us, 
make us of these people who do this good business, inshaAllah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked the hellfire, the people, people of the hellfire, the same thing. And he said, oh, but in that one day of yours, you did very bad business. The business you did there is you purchased the fire from me. And my, my anger and my dissatisfaction, now you're going to have to remain like that because that's your purchase. You're going to have to live with your purchase now. Allahu Akbar. That ends Surah uh, that ends Surah Al Mu'minun. Now we move on to Surah Al Nur. Surah Al Nur is very different from Surah Al Mu'minun. Surah Al Nur then is a Madani Surah, and among the Madani Surahs also, it is extremely rich with hukum after hukum, ruling after ruling. Immense amount of juridical ruling is mentioned in here. It's very interesting. It just goes from one point to the next point to the next point. There are just so much which we're going to have to kind of rush to explain uh, so that we can hopefully cover all of the, most of them, if not all of them. This surah, it, it has 64 verses and it has nine, it's split up into nine sections. And the reason why it's called Surah to nur is because it has, I would say, probably my favorite verse in this surah, which we'll be looking at when we get there. Allahu nuru samawati wal ard. So we will be looking at that. That's why it's called Surah Al-Nur. Otherwise, it could have been called, uh, to be honest, it could have been called Surah Al-Haya, right? Uh, the chapter of modesty. It could have been called the chapter of uh, protection, of morality. It could have been called, it could have been called a number of things because you'll see a lot of the verses. It could have been called a chapter of slander. This is a huge slandering uh, incident mentioned in there. So there's a lot of things mentioned in there. Now that's why, because... You see the difference between this surah and uh, Surah Al-Ma'idah. According to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Mujahid relates that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam once said that the men should do a close reading of Surah Al-Ma'idah. Now that, that's much larger. It's a huge surah and it has numerous different categories of laws. Whereas Surah Al-Nur has more of a law uh, and and he said that the women should study Surah Al-Nisa very carefully. Surah Al-Nisa has got a lot to do with issues related to modesty, chastity, covering, uh, looking, intergender relationships are huge in there. You know, um, a lot of that is there. And seriously, everybody should read this, especially the women, but everybody should read this. That's why the ahkam that are mentioned in here, they're to, they're to do with uh, kind of intergender and just... just communication with one another. All of that is, is included in there. So Aisha radiallahu anha used to specifically encourage that women should be taught this surah. She used to really emphasize that women should be taught this surah. A lot of discussion with uh, home issues, issues related to home and certain adab and akhlaq and so on. So let us begin quickly now. You'll have to follow. You can actually see this as we go along. It starts off suratun it starts off very interesting and totally very unique Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim suratun anzalnaha wa faradnaha wa anzalna fiha ayatin bayyinatin la'allakum tadhakkarun This is a surah that we've revealed and we've obligated right we've obligated and in it we've revealed some very very clear verses so that you can take a lesson you can take heed now, after saying that, the first thing that's, discussion, uh, that, that's discussed is the penalty for fornication. And basically, the simple penalty that's mentioned here is that if somebody is not being married and they commit fornication, zina, then they get 100 stripes, 100 lashes. And uh, there's a whole discussion of that. Then, another thing that it mentions is that people who do commit zina, Right? They're ne not going to be necessarily people that other good people will want to marry. Right? Kind of shows the general aversion from people committing zina. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the next law that's mentioned in here, the next ruling that's mentioned in here, um, it doesn't mention here if somebody is married, a married individual, because that one is stoning to death. That's kind of the Islamic penalty. It's not in the Qur'an. There used to be verses that were read in the Qur'an before as mentioned in Sahih Hadith from Umar anhu, etc. But now that comes from Mutawatir Hadith that that is 
the ruling, though it's not mentioned in the Quran. The, in the Quran, it only mentions the ruling for non-married individuals who fornicate. For the married individuals and the stoning, that's mentioned through uh, contiguously transmitted uh, widespread narrations. The next ruling that's mentioned here is that of uh, the penalty for slandering somebody. So Islam doesn't want you to go around saying that that's a, he's a fornicator, she's a fornicator, he's going out with her and so on and so forth. Because what that does is that just creates a bad vibe among the community and then other people get instigated to do that. That's why they say that one of this, uh, this whole sexual openness right, and the openness of vice and all of these other forms of sh sexual deviances uh, that started after the 1950s, they said that one of, the one of the big causes and factors that led to this openness happening was the Kinsey Report, which basically reported various t types of people mentioning and then gave these statistics and so on, and a lot of questions are uh, surrounding that. So basically the idea is that the more you talk about illicit relationships and that people are doing this or he's doing that or he's doing that, it creates in other people the need, uh, the, 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 uh, the courage to do that as well, right? Or the idea to do that as well. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want this discuss. He wants to bury it as much as possible, right? Unless you can prove it beyond doubt by providing four witnesses. That's why if anybody slanders something that she... Uh, she, she basically uh, committed fornication or he did then they would have to bring four witnesses to that there would be, have to be four witnesses if there's not and they can't produce that which is a whole discussion um, then they get actually flogged for slandering so it's a very very difficult bar to, uh, to fulfill and that's the idea here so that's discussion then it says that anybody who's like that will never be forgiven forever meaning not only really forgiven for Allah may forgive them if they make tawbah for slandering somebody but they according to the Hanafi madhab they're not their their witnessing in court is never going to be accepted again the other madhab they allow it after they've made tawbah but the Hanafis say that Allah mentions this forever so they're witnessing they will never be trustworthy individuals again so it's quite severe to slander somebody Right? Then after that, from verse uh, 6, it's about sla uh, s accusing your wife of fornication. Accusing the wife of fornication, again, you have to bring for evidence, same thing. You can't just get away with it. Now, if she wants, she can pull him to court. If she does that, and he can't provide the witnesses, then basically, he will be forced to do what we call, uh, which is described here, it's, uh, it's called, uh, Allahu Akbar, li'an, mula'ana which is basically mutually cursing one another. And there's a whole procedure for this. The man will swear four oaths first that he's telling the truth. Right? Then a fifth one, he will say that, the fifth time he will say that Allah's curse be upon me if I'm a liar. So four times he'll swear enough that he's, the tr he's, he's right. And the fifth time he'll say that Allah's curse be upon me if I'm a liar. Then she has to then respond to that and deflect that by, by basically providing testimony four times that he is a liar so accusing him of lying right and the fifth time she then has to say upon herself that Allah's anger be upon me if he is right if he's correct now remember this is severe four times four times and then a fifth time that's very severe most of the time people are not going to get to that level although in some cases they have and subhanallah then what happens is that if, they, if the wife does do that, that means they're both insisting on their side of the story. He's insisting that she did fornicate. He, she's insisting she didn't. Nobody's giving. Then what the qadi, the judge will do is that he'll basically separate between them. These guys cannot stay. I mean, they've cursed one another. They cannot remain together anymore. So then they get separated. Right? That's how it happens. Now from verse 11, uh, for a good number of verses starts the story of the major slander and accusation against Aisha the story is long you can read about it it's in Bukhari it will be in the tafsir books and so on but basically what happened is that the Prophet etc were on a journey and Aisha was being carried in a howdah right a palanquin and she'd lost a necklace so she'd gone out lost the necklace went looking for it they thought that she's still inside uh, on in the palanquin because they couldn't look inside it's all covered so they carried on and then there's Safwan radiallahu anhu, who was like the person in charge of making sure nobody had left anything at the back. He sees Aisha and they're crying. She's a young girl, like she's, you know, in her early teens as such. So he averts his gaze. He recognizes her from 
the fact that he'd seen her before the hijab had come down. And, uh, and then after that, basically, he helped her and uh, set, uh, he got her to sit on the animal and they, they caught up with everybody else. However, this was, much, this was uh, unfortunately, uh, the, 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 the time for the munafiqeen to start their rumors. So they started saying that she committed zina with him. They've got something going on. Subhanallah, there were a few good believers that got caught up in that for different reasons. Just a few, one or two, right? And so, I, long story, Aisha is very distraught. The Prophet is very concerned. He's asking a number of questions. And finally, she decides that she's going to go to her parents' house. And she thought Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give him a dream. And it will clear, because she was obviously clear that she had done anything wrong. But this was a major test in the Prophet ﷺ's life. Because with his, you know, with Aisha radiallahu anha. And finally, mashallah, this surah comes down with these verses. Right? And she is over the moon. It's like, I never expected that the Quran would be revealed. Like verses in the Quran will be revealed for me. Right? That will remain until day of judgment. That's amazing. That shows you the love for Aisha radiallahu anha that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to basically exonerate her and to free her and to make her, you know, render her chaste. That's why I still don't understand why there's people who hate her. Certain people who call themselves Muslim slander Aisha. Like what did the Prophet see in her that he married her? And they have all sorts of problems just because of some other small incidents and things like that. The Quran is talking about her in numerous verses. This is, according to many ulama, this is, if you look at all the scriptures, this is probably the first time in any scripture, that in any divine scripture, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed so much about the innocence of a particular individual in so many verses, not just even in the passing. Right? So that's from verse, uh, you'll, you'll, see, you'll see all of that from verse 11 all the way until verse 20. All of that is a discussion of how they should have reacted and so on. And we'll look at some of those reactions. Uh, some react There's 10 verses that uh, came down for a reason. That's an amazing honor for her. Anyway, let's move on quickly. The next set of verses then, uh, there, there's some additional verses after that. Then the next set of verses, the ruling is about entering. I mean, there's lots about chastity and everything like that, which you'll see here. And having uh, people married off that are in the... Um, that are at the age of marriage and so on. Then after that, the sixth command that you see here will be about don't enter homes without seeking permission. Right? If you've got your own storeroom, whatever, you can go in there. But if it's a home where there'll be other people, then you shouldn't go in there. You should always ask for permission and so on. The seventh one is about the famous verses of lowering the gaze. So that you see from Kullil Mu'minina and uh, verse 30 and 31, very detailed laws of who you can look at, who you shouldn't look at, who you should lower the gaze from, and so on and so forth. All of that is discussed. Uh, you can look at that in detail. And uh, it's a very important thing, but people today in the modern world is very difficult, right, to do this, and that's why people have just given up on this, right? They think, they, 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 a lot of people just think that if a woman is wearing hijab, you can look at her, what's the problem? And that is not correct. That is not what the Quran is saying. It's completely against the Quran to do that. Only is when you have need. There's a, it's a separate issue about whether a woman needs to cover her face or not. There's that difference of opinion as to whether the face needs to be covered or not. That's there, about whether niqab is necessary or not. But whether it's necessary or not, it doesn't mean a man is allowed to just look without need. right? Yes, they've allowed for need, but not without need. And that's where the whole discussion is that almost like they've made it default that it's okay. As long as she's got hijab and you can admire the beauty. Whereas the hadith makes it very clear that if you do look at any part of another person, you know, uh, to, uh, uh, of their beauty, right, which is not halal for you, it's not your wife, or, then, then that, there's, there's punishment mentioned for that. And may Allah help us uh, with these things. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses uh, several issues related to, then also in that was the discussion about not revealing your beauty as well, covering up and not revealing your beauty. Right, so that's the entire head, including the ears. Right, hijab needs to be worn, and, and all of that is discussed. Uh, all of that is discussed in here about not revealing the beauty except that which is. And there's interpretations as to what that means, as to what is already clearly, uh, you know, whatever is uh, appears anyway. Then comes the discussion about uh, rights of slaves. Right, Subhanallah. I mean, is, uh, Islam inherited slavery. I mean, it was there already. So Islam, what it did was it just pushed up their status so they were extremely persecuted 
they were downtrodden, they had absolutely no rights. Islam gave them huge amount of rights to get the, 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 them to start respecting themselves almost. That's why there was huge recommendations for them to be uh, freed, uh, for, for penalties, for wrongs that you would have done, for missing a fast, for example, breaking a fast rather, you free a slave, and so many other things. Give them the same food that you eat, clothe them well, don't overburden them, don't tax them, and so on. Marry them off as well when they need marriage. All of that discussion is in here. And I'm, I'm rushing quite to try to c cover all of this because it's quite a struggle to do this. And then discussing those who, um, you know, if they've got the money, if they've got the means to marry, then, and the age to marry, then they should be married. They should be married off. Uh, some of the other things, uh, I'm going to miss out the, uh, the Noor verse, just to carry on to finish off some of the other ahkam. That, then you, uh, 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 the uh, uh, tenth ruling that's mentioned in here is that there was this practice among the people of Jahiliyyah that they would keep certain slave girls and they, they would basically be prostitutes. So um, they wouldn't want to do this themselves. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying is that وَلَا تُكْرِهُ فَتَيَاتِكُمْ عَلَى الْبِغَاءِ إِنْ أَرَدْنَ تَحَسُّنًا لِتَبْتَغُوا عَرَدَ الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا وَمَنْ يُكْرِهُنَّ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ مِنْ بَعْدِ إِكْرَاهِينَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ That you shouldn't do that. Now some people, when you read this literally, it means that if they want to stay chaste, then don't do that. That's not really what it's saying. It says don't do that, especially since they want to stay chaste. If they want to chase, they don't want to do it. Why are you doing it? You should be more chaste. Okay, if you've done this in the past, you will be forgiven, right? If you make tawbah and you make amends. So this uh, is also related to Abdullah ibn Ubay uh, bin Salul, the, uh, uh, the, the chief munafiq and hypocrite. He actually had a whole industry of this going. He had, you know, uh, a whole setup with women like that, that he would do this. And uh, that's why all of this had to stop, basically, once the Quran was, was revealed and once... Um, Islam came to Medina Munawwara. So these are the 10 different commands that are mentioned there, right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions. And then after that, there are three other examples that are provided here. The first example is for the people of Iman. And the second and third example are the people of, for the people of Batil. And that is, that comes in the famous verses for which this surah is revealed. So that's verse 35 to 40. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allahu nuru samawati wal ard, mathalu nurihi ka mishkatin fiha misbah, al misbahu fi zujaja, al zujaja tu ka annaha kaukabu durriyu yuqadu min shajaratin mubarakatin zaytuna. زيتونة لا شرقية ولا غربية يكاد زيتها يضيء يكاد زيتها يضيء ولو لم تمسسه نار نور على نور يهدي الله لنوره من يشاء ويضرب الله الأمثال للناس والله بكل شيء عليم It's quite a simple example but a very complicated idea is being expressed by it. The idea is that in those days when you didn't have these lights the way we have them, your best form of light was depended on how clean the glass casing was in which your lamp was, where it was placed, whether it, which way it was reflecting, and also the oil that you used. The purity of the oil would make a, more, a better kindling of the fire of the light. So Allah provides example that this is like a lamp, right? It's like a lamp in a very clear crystal uh, uh, um, glass case that is placed in a niche, right? In a very strategic way. And the oil that's used is from zaytun. It's from olive. And the, particularly telling us where that olive tree comes from as well, it's an olive tree. That olive comes from a tree which is kind of in a central location. So it gets both the morning sun and the afternoon sun. So it's not on one side. So it gets a full potent amount of sun, uh, 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 sun and thus it creates the best of oil. So that there's a lot of hidden messages in there. There's a lot of subtleties mentioned in there. There's a lot of tafsir ishari from here. If you look at the likes of Ruhul Ma'ani, right, of Alusi, if you look at some of the other Ishari tafsirs like Ibn Ajiba, etc., it's quite amazing 
right, the other meanings that come from here. So the idea is that this is like a believer. What it says there is that the olive oil is such that it sparkles even though a flame has not touched it yet. Uh, there's, it's not been kindled yet, but it's already sparkling, which means that it's just raring to go. This is the example of a believer that when they've got goodness in them, even before they learn about a mas'ala, learn about a ruling, learn about an ethics of, uh, the ethics of something, they already kind of are in the right direction. They already have their heart predisposed in the right way. That's just one understanding of this verse. Just showing the purity of a good person, right? And that's made of sincerity. That basically shows that if a person always is finding difficult to agree with Islamic ideas, or why is this like this? I'm going, to, I'm going to begrudgingly have to believe that I don't get it, I don't really agree with it, and so on. There's a sincerity issue there, right? This is what we want. And pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah opens up our heart to give us this status. Because that's a really beautiful. Then Allah talks about the houses of Allah, right? They're the ones in which Allah has permitted that His name be elevated and so on in there. And people are, may Allah make us of these, yusabbihu lahu fiha, in it, people, uh, they are making His tasbih and glorification, morning and evening, rijalun, such men are doing this, tulhi, la tulhim tijaratun wala bay. Nothing is, which is, who, Nothing distracts from the remembrance of Allah and establishing the prayer and giving zakat. And they are fearful of the day in which the qulub and the absar, the eyes and the hearts, are going to be basically turned around, turned upside down. So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give them a reward. That's beautiful. Then the next two verses, 39 and 40, are the two examples of disbelief. And it's all about darkness. So the first one, he says, that their actions are like a mirage. I don't know if any of you have seen a mirage. I mean, I remember in South Africa when we used to have the wrong, long roads that we used to travel on. See numerous mirages in the, future, in the, in the distance. You see that like there's a little stream or something, just water. And as you get closer, it suddenly dissipates. Right? That's a mirage, saying that their deeds they do, they think they're onto something. All of these great things that they're doing, but they're onto nothing basically. Right? Because when they get to the hereafter, they'll find out that la, they used to just think, yuhsinuna sun'a. Right? And then the second example is even worse, that they are in such darknesses of knowing proper knowledge, that they are so unaware, they are so ignorant, that, subhanAllah, look at this example, this, in such darknesses that they're in the middle of an ocean, and there's one wave on top of them. On that is another wave. I mean, subhanAllah, I mean, I re remember I was in Trinidad a few months ago, and it was very choppy, right? It was very rough. And eventually there came a time when you're just like, let's get out of here. Because it, even though it's not dark out, it actually seems dark when the waves just start rolling. So you're talking about one wave, another wave on top of that, and above that are the dark clouds. And it says that it's such darkness, one on top of the other, layers of darkness upon one another, if he ex extended his hand, he can't even see his own hand. And then Allah says the clinching point, وَمَنْ لَمْ يَجْعَلِ اللَّهُ لَهُ نُورًا فَمَا لَهُ مِنْ نور. Whoever Allah does not designate any light for, he has no light. And that's why in the previous one he talked about a believer, he said, Nurun ala nur. That person's situation is that light upon light. He's got the natural predispos predisposition to the truth and faith. And then when he gets the faith, and when he learns more about the faith and the knowledge comes about, that's light upon light. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that light upon light. Thereafter, um, as I said, most of the ahkam were mentioned before this verse, then you've got three of other verses uh, that are mentioned afterwards. So you've got a number of others. Uh, one other prominent one to point out is verse 50, 58. That is a very specific verse about the home and who should take permission. Should you go barging into somebody's door? Should children be allowed or taught to, to knock and so on? So he basically says that until they're not mature, then they can move around freely except at three times. One is in the early morning, one is late night after Isha, or whenever people go to sleep now in today, because you know sometimes Isha is six o'clock right now here, right? And in the peak afternoon when it's siesta time. Because generally then the, the parents may be in their night clothing, or they may be in some other you know, uh, uh, position where the children should see, you know, so they should be taught to do that. They shouldn't just barge in. That also tells you about basically having children sleep with you and being careful with that as well. Then it says in the next verse, 
When a child reaches maturity, then they're just like adults. فَلْيَسْتَأْذِنُوا Then they should seek permission at any time, just as, you know, uh, the, the older people do, and, and so on and so forth. So all of that is discussed. Then after that, the discussion about older women who are not at the level of, at the age of marriage anymore. They're old, maybe decrepitude or whatever. Well, قَوَائِدْ مِنَ nisa. Those who are now just retired, old women, they, they, they don't have such severe uh, hijab obligations. So they can be more relaxed in their hijab. That's why it's allowed even for a young man to shake hands with a nun mahram, older woman, like very old woman who is beyond the age of desire, right? He's allowed like a grandmother, like an old grandmother, right? Uh, he's allowed to shake hands as well, in fact, uh, because there's no fitna in that case. Then the next verse, which is 61, is a very interesting verse. Have you ever been to your auntie's house and you felt bad about eating? like a bit embarrassed to eat, or your uncle's house or your brother's house, you shouldn't do. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that there's no haraj. There, there should be no, I mean, unless somebody's got a problem. That tells both sides of the story. You shouldn't have a problem with feeling, fee, feeling free, right, at your aunt's house or brother's house. It mentions your parents' house, uh, your father's house, your mother's house, your brother's house, your, your sisters, your maternal and paternal uncles and aunties. Right? And those that, whose keys you have. So somebody who's given you access to their place, a good friend. Here's the keys, you can come in anytime you want. Right? And uh, likewise, or your friend. You can either eat together or you can eat separately. Of course, you don't go in there, always raid their fridge. Or raid their favorite chocolates. Right? That's not what you do. But the idea is that when you need, you can go in there and eat. And they should be open enough to allow you to do that because you need that much kind of freedom, right? I went to my auntie's house the other day. My uncle was there and I just wanted some tissue to give something to someone. And I said, can I take one? He said, this is your uncle's house. And I just remember this verse. This is your uncle's house. You shouldn't have to ask here. And I remember this verse, right? That's the God paradigm, subhanAllah. And that basically helps us then to uh, finish the surah off. We've had to... We've had to rush it. But let me, let me mention a few other things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then numerous other points are mentioned in here of the coming of the day and night. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending down the rain, the creation of the heavens and the earth, the flying of the birds, all of that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is behind that. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created multiple types of beasts and animals. And all of that essentially is being shown as the evidence of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all of that is mentioned in here. And you'll see that between verse 41 and 45, for example. Thereafter that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this whole contrast again between the munafiqeen and the believers. Right? So there's like a comparative discussion there. The munafiq and, and, and so on. And how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that it will be the believers who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make the inheritors. And that's exactly what happened, because then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you look at verses 47 to 55, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about them becoming inheritors, and that is exactly what happened, because the whole Jaziratul Arab came under the Muslims within, within a very short amount of time, during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then also says, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ, لا تحسبن الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مُعْجِزِينَ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَمَأْوَاهُمُ النَّارِ وَلَا بِئْسَ الْمَصِيرِ They're going to end up in, in hellfire anyway. But Allah says before that, وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُ الزَّكَاةَ وَأَطِيعُ الرَّسُولَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ Again, establish the prayer. Give the zakat. And be obedient to the messenger so that you be shown mercy. And before that, the verse before that, which is verse 55, وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِنُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Which is the one I mentioned, that Allah has promised those who believe among you and who've done good deed, لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ Allah will make them the inheritors on the earth. كَمَا اسْتَخْلَفَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ وَلَيُمَكِّنَنَّ لَهُمْ دِينَهُمْ الَّذِي ارْتَضَى لَهُمْ He will give them the strength and firmness in the faith that he's chosen for them. And he will ch change all of the fear they've had to safety. May Allah grant us that as well. And may Allah grant that to the people who are in fear today in various parts of the world, 
they need to focus on these verses. What does he say? What does Allah say to do that? He's always giving you the reasoning. They worship me well and they do not commit shirk with me. Okay, what else is in here? Let's see. Yes, uh, one of the verses uh, mentioned something in which I forgot to mention. At the end of that long verse, 61, which talks about you can eat uh, at your uh, close relatives' homes, it says, فَإِذَا دَخَلْتُمْ بُيُوتًا فَسَلِّمُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِكُمْ تَحِيَّةً مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ مُبَارَكًا طَيِّبًا When you do enter the homes, make sure you make salam upon yourself. Upon yourself, whoever's there, as a greeting. That's why our hukum is that even when we are going to be alone in the house and we enter, we still say, As-salamu alayna wa ala ibadillahi salihin. Peace be upon us and any of the righteous servants of Allah that exist here, whether that be angels or jinn. Please read this for yourself. You really enjoy it. Number one, if you go to verse 16, وَلَوْلَا إِسْتَمِعْتُمُهُ قُلْتُمْ مَا يَكُونُ لَنَا أَنَّ نتكلم بِهَذَا When you heard about this slander, right, you should have said, like, why didn't you say? I mean, uh, in, in this whole if story, the slander story in Aisha radiallahu and these 10 verses, it's always like, why didn't you do it this way? Why didn't you do it this way? It's like, didn't you have common sense? Didn't you have concern for others? Didn't you have compassion in your mind? Didn't, why, why didn't you do it this way? Why didn't you do it this way? And then in several places there, it said, if it hadn't been for the mercy of Allah, right, or uh, the grace of Allah and His mercy, then this would have happened, then this would have happened. So, number one in this one, it says, when you heard about it, why didn't you say that this is unbecoming of us, this is wrong for us to speak about this? Subhanaka hadha buhtanun azim. This is a major slander, a mighty slander. Allah reminds you, in the next verse it says, Allah reminds you or advises you on this so that you don't do this again ever if you're true believers. So how can believers today, if Allah is reminding us there from that as a story, how can we ever take part in slanders? Be very careful when rumors start flying. Just because 10 people are saying it or 100 people are saying it doesn't make it true. Right? Maybe a part of it is true. Right? But don't always, if you need to, you need to find out. Otherwise, just ignore, ignore, ignore. If it becomes necessary for you to find out, then figure it out. Right? And even then, you only do what's exactly right for you to do. Then the next verse, subhanallah. I remember once I asked a scholar about somebody in a book, another Muslim. Uh, right? It was an academic who'd written about some immorality. Right? And I felt it was a bit too much that they touched. They didn't have to because these things should be kept subdued. You indicate towards them. And I remember he gave me this verse at that time. He says, verse 19, amanu, lahum alimun fid dunya wal akhirah. Those who would like that immorality and unchastity be spread and become widespread among the people who believe, for them is a severe punishment. So you know all of those who are calling to take hijabs off, all those who are calling to have free intermingling, right? And this is allowed and that's allowed. They need to think about this, right? I'm not here to provide the boundaries, not a thick discussion, but they need to be very carefully when they have that discussion, right? when they want free mixing in, in, in this immoral way and all that kind of stuff, they need to think about this because those who love that to happen, they're going to have a severe punishment in the dunya and akhirah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and you do not know. So that's another one. And the other famous or very prominent verse that is off quoted or part of it is verse 21. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu la tattabi'u khutuwati shaytan. O people who believe, do not follow in the footsteps of the shaytan. See, shaitan never makes you do the big act first. It's always look, enjoy, admire, speak, communicate, touch, and then it moves on, right? So be careful. The first one will be uh, a woman is fully covered, a man is fully covered. Let's show a bit. Let's just wear slightly tighter clothing. Let's just leggings, for example. And then it goes like that. Let's just show a bit online, on Facebook. It's okay. Let's just say a few things. Let's put my face up there first. That's then a bit of a revealing pose, a bit of a um, sensual pose. And then it goes on from that until Allah protects. So that's the way shaitan makes people do these things. shaitan. Whoever follows in the footsteps of shaitan, فَإِنَّهُ يَأْمُرُ بِالْفَحْشَاءِ وَالْمُنْكَرِ he just commands immorality and wrong. Allahu Akbar.
And had it not been for the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His mercy, He would not have purified anybody. But Allah purifies whoever wishes. May Allah make us of them. And then the next verse, 22, is a very interesting verse. It says that those of you who have substance, abundance, who have, who have wealth, should not swear an oath, right? That they're not going to give sadaqah to their relatives anymore. Or the miskeen and so on. You know, this is about Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu There was a cousin, there was a relative of Aisha radiallahu His name was Mista. He was a good guy and he was a believer. But he got caught up in this somehow. So Abu Bakr, when he heard that he got caught up in this, he swore an oath that he, he basically swore that he's not going to help him. He used to help him out. He wasn't. And his mother was actually, used to be with Aisha the other time and she was very upset what her son did. So Abu Bakr the other is being told, Allah loves him so much, that no, those of you who have grace and abundance, they should not make such oaths. They should continue to spend. So be forgiving is also mentioned in here. So that's another verse. And... Uh, I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of things which you need to read for yourself. But to finish off, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in these last few verses, or rather we're told that do not call on to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the way you call on to other people. لا تجعلوا دعاء الرسول بينكم كدعاء بعضكم بعضا Verse, 90, uh, verse 63. Do not make your summoning of one uh, summoning of the Prophet وسلم, the way you discuss and call unto the Prophet وسلم, between you. Let that not be the way you call unto one another. Right. So that showing about adab with the Prophet وسلم, That's why many ulama also and there's uh, in Surah Al Hujarat there'll be more discussion of that. So we'll look at it there. But eventually this surah ends with. For Allah is the <clears throat> everything that's in the heavens and the earth. He knows exactly what position you're on. And the day that everybody's going to be returned to him, he will inform them of what they used to do. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything. Remember that hard drive. Amazing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has everything recorded. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us on that day. Uh, Surah Al-Furqan, while it starts in this chapter, but um, most of the discussion of it will come in tomorrow's discussion. So inshallah, we'll leave that for tomorrow. But by this, our chapter 18 has been completed. Let us just do a quick uh, recap as we end this. Um, it start, the surah started off, Surah Al-Mu'mineen, Surah Al-Mu'minun, it started off with the description of what the true believers are like and how they're going to reach uh, and why they're going to reach the falah and success that they have. Then it had a discussion for us to reflect on about Nuh Ali Salam's story. And then there were a few other prophets that were mentioned in order to also strengthen the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and console him. Then after that, there was the discussion, which we didn't really go into, about uh, death and when a person is close to death and where then after that, the day of judgment and so on. Then Allah says about disbelievers, إِنَّهُ لَا يُفْلِحُ الْكَافِرُونَ Whereas for believers, He says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Disbelievers will never gain falah, whereas believers are given falah. Did you see the ending of Surah Al-Mu'minun? Where, where I told you to check what the contrast will be with the beginning of Surah Day. It said, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ And if you look at verse 117, it said, وَمَنْ يَدْعُ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخر لا برهان له به فإنما حسابه عند رب إنه لا يفلح الكافرون. Right. So there's that contrast, beautiful in the way it was done. Thereafter, when Surah Al-Mu'minun begins, uh, actually no, Surah Al-Nur begins. It discusses the. These are all the rulings, right? This it discusses the penalty for fornication, for slander, the command of uh, mutual cursing for somebody who slanders their wife and so on then the whole story of slander of Aisha radiallahu anha is, is mentioned numerous nasiha and advices provided in there and uh, bec that basically becomes a huge virtue for Aisha radiallahu anha may Allah uh, be pleased with her and the discussion that you shouldn't like to sp have um, immorality and unchastity spread among people so there's a reason why people are quite strict on things like this. There's a reason. It's a Quranic paradigm to do that. 
then there's the discussion of uh, letting people go right and not uh, you know once people have made amends you do not you know hold grudges against them especially if they're relatives as i just mentioned abu bakr radiyallahu anhu story in that verse then the discussion about seeking permission when entering the house lowering the gaze protecting one's private parts protecting one's beauty from being displayed in front of the, those that they're not supposed to then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the beautiful verse of nur right about uh, the light and then the darkness of the kufr then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the promise about believers becoming inheritors uh, of the earth uh, as long as they establish salat and give zakat and do amal ma'roof and nahi anil munkar then there's the uh, all the rulings of entering the home and entering rooms and seeking permission and so on uh, hijab of older women is discussed then and um, so yeah that's a lot of the the discussion is done there and the permissibility of eating you know feeling comfortable about eating from one another's house in terms of relatives and then the adab of speaking to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is mentioned and then after that the beginning of surah al-furqan which we will inshallah do tomorrow furqan is the criterion may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to continue and finish off alhamdulillah he's given us the ability to do 18 juz so far which is mashallah truly a grace of god truly a grace of allah that he's allowed us to do this and may allah accept it from us from all of us those who listen those who do those who facilitate and may Allah make this Ramadan better than any Ramadan before it for us. And may Allah make subsequent Ramadans even better and allow us to reach them. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alam.